My novel Golgotha is a murder mystery set in the First World War trenches and is based around real events and real historic characters. Now one of the little stories I've been holding on to for a while, and I was desperate to somehow shoehorn it into the book, was that of Mademoiselle Helen Duclos. So it's my pleasure here to tell her amazing story. Now there are numerous heroic tales from the First World War, but one that seems to have gone completely missing is the story of Duclos, a French woman who refused to be told she could take no part in supporting her country during the war. Duclos explained in a newspaper interview she gave in 1915, I was determined to do something for my country in the fighting field, something more than soothing the fevered brow. Duclos herself went on to expound on her own proud family history. My great-grandfather was a captain of grenadiers under Napoleon, and the blood of generations of soldiers run in my veins. To give you an idea of the pedigree of the woman the Germans would grow to wish had stayed behind and simply dabbed the fevered brow of a wounded soldier, I had been used to running all kinds of cars since my childhood, and was as fit for this work as any human being could be, but I found the authorities would not let a woman into the combat services. Determined to fight, Mademoiselle Duclos joined the enlistment queue along with thousands of young Frenchmen hoping to join one of the fighting automobile services. Refusing to let something as trivial as her sex stop her from serving, Duclos next dressed herself as a man and tried again. Once more her effort failed, this time due to the quote, rigid physical examination the military doctors undertook on each recruit. I can just see the surprise on their faces when they realised this man in front of them was actually a woman. Perhaps out of pure frustration, Duclos finally relented to the weight of bureaucracy it weighed against her, and she gave up her dream of fighting. She was, however, far from done, and joined one of the private ambulance organisations that were springing up across the country to help retrieve the thousands of wounded soldiers streaming back from the Western Front. These organisations' needs were so urgent, many of them had already accepted women drivers. The First World War was unusual for a number of reasons, but the most overlooked was its growing reliability on mechanised transport. Not the first tanks, which were still years away from entering service at this stage, nor the flimsy aeroplanes that would be dogfighting overhead. At the start of the war, one of the most effective weapons was the armoured car. The wide, flat spaces of Europe were perfect for armoured cars to zip around, acting like cavalry of old. They would rule the battlefield until the heavily trenched and cratered moonscape that is the usual image of the Western Front began appearing, restricting their use. During this early, more open stage of the war, these large motor cars, protected by welded boilerplates and machine guns, zoomed around the battlefield like miniature battleships. They could be brought up quickly to support, attack or defend a position, or more increasingly they could drive into no man's land and pick up stranded pilots after crash landing their biplanes. With the use of grappling hooks, these vehicles could strip a section of enemy lines of their barbed wire or, driven at 60 miles per hour, be driven at full speed into close formations of enemy soldiers, where the car's powerful, quote, injury was unlimited. One famous such encounter was when a Belgian armoured car came across a section of Uhlans, enemy cavalry. The car gunned down almost the entire section with absolutely no injury to themselves. These sorts of lopsided victories meant very quickly the traditional horse riding units that were once the cornerstone of a European army were converted to foot slogging riflemen or given armoured cars of their own. Finally she was now part of the war and Helen later recalled she transformed a 60 horsepower 8 seated touring car into a motor ambulance for 4 badly wounded men or 8 slightly wounded soldiers. I qualified for the service and was authorised to proceed to the front in Alsace accompanied by a mechanic. While performing my ambulance duties, I had a good opportunity to watch the armoured automobiles and realised that their work was the most exciting and perhaps the most decisive of the war. Of course, at this time, Duclos could have no idea of the horror to come once the conflict stagnated into the chessboard of trenches and armoured pillboxes we know as the Western Front. After taking a number of wounded men to a nearby field hospital, it was while driving around the front lines looking for more people to help that Helen headed along a little-used mountainside track where she could hear distant fighting. Pulling around one long corner, the ambulance came across a disabled French armoured car in the middle of the road. Along the distant tree line, a section of German soldiers had taken up position and were firing on the stricken vehicle. Inside the French car, at least one soldier, still protected by the vehicle's thick armour, was keeping up a steady stream of machine gun fire, holding the enemy at bay. 
About the front of the car lay a number of the vehicle's crew, dead after getting shot while trying to repair the vehicle's engine so they could drive out of harm's way. Trouble was the armoured car wasn't going anywhere and the Germans had worked out where the sections were the vehicle's gun could not be brought to bear. As Helen arrived, the Germans were just beginning to move up in large numbers along the safe channel to kill the surviving occupants. Gunning her engine into life, Duclos raced up to the stricken armoured car, pulled up and screamed, Get in! The surviving Frenchman saw his chance and dove into the ambulance. Duclos then punched the accelerator and, with bullets pinging off the vehicle's armour, raced back down the road to safety. The surviving soldier decided they needed to do something about the stricken car. He knew the Germans would see it as a great prize and they'd try and drag it back to their own lines, so demanded on taking control of the ambulance to get it back. If the Frenchman had thought the Germans were tough, he hadn't counted on the feisty Mademoiselle Duclos. Insisting she was the only one capable of driving her car, then proving it as she sped to the point where they decided would be the likeliest place the Germans would have to pass by with a stricken vehicle, they were soon in position. After a short time, the armoured car came into view, pulled by around 40 Germans hauling on a rope. Far too many for the lone French soldier to handle. Step in, Mademoiselle Helene Duclos. The two-ton vehicle sped down the hill and drove at full speed into the German line, bowling over many of the soldiers like so many ten pins. Metal struck flesh and bone with the predictable result of limbs and bodies being torn apart. Meanwhile, the steel-skinned ambulance raced on, tearing into even more German soldiers. To quote, I felt like the very incarnation of the spirit of destruction and revenge. I was not human. Out of the 40 soldiers, only a handful had survived, and these soon succumbed to a hail of grenades. This victory was short-lived, however, when a squadron of Uhlans rode into the scene. The French soldier quickly ran up, tied the vehicle to the ambulance, and they started to move away just as a rescue arrived, when two more French armoured cars drove into the battle and engaged the charging cavalry. Flanked by these two running war machines, the ambulance dragged the stricken armoured car back towards the Allied lines. Here, Mademoiselle Helen Duclos received not only the warmest congratulations of her fellow countrymen, but was awarded the Military Cross of the Legion of Honour by Marshal Joffrey. Now you think such an act would be celebrated everywhere, but it's been very hard to find any actual evidence of Duclos and her amazing act. Everything in this little clip comes from a few newspapers written around the time, mostly from Australian and US newspapers, who proudly printed the tale. So if there's anybody out there who has any more information about Helen Duclos, please share it on the links below. And that's her story, and I hope you enjoyed yourselves, and I hope you give my novel Golgotha a bit of a read, because honestly, it's a rollicking tale and it's just one of those stories that you just don't get anymore. So I hope you read the book and I'll talk to you later.